Now my dishwasher is being loud. Oh, we do have some people. Yay. We do have a small fan club. Hello, everyone. <laughs> We're so excited you're joining us. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. Yes, right, right, at, right at the top of the hour. It's fun to see people. Thank you so much. Hopefully next year we'll be able to do these, um, you know, back in the planetarium. That'd be great. See. Frankie, you already turned off your, your camera, but I'm gonna make you introduce yourself. <laughs> Just so everybody knows who are, you know, we're missing two of our staff people, but we want, yeah, I want everyone to know fabulous people we have on our staff. So um, just so everybody knows, the chat is open, so you can um, send uh, questions or comments to us through that way. Um, we as panelists can see it. Um, and then you can also use the Q&A feature that's on your, um, on your screen uh, to send us questions. And um, we will send those questions into, into Peggy. Um, and so record or just, is the other or thing. Or just read them out when we have the Q&A time. Yes, you tell me when you, yes, when you want those. All right, and I am gonna record this. We'll load it to our YouTube channel. We're gonna do it on Facebook today because um, we tend to get a little bit more participation that way. Um, so is everyone, is ever, are everyone joining us? Are you all Elginites or do we have people from other places joining us today? We'd love to know where you're from. Uh, and it's six o'clock. And so um, my name is Deb McMullen. I am um, the, um, what am I? I'm the, <laughs> I'm the coordinator for K-12 Science and Planetarium. Um, so that basically means that um, I'm a person that supports um, any science that's going on in the district. And I have an amazing team with me. Um, Frankie, you wanna introduce yourself first? Sure, I'm Frankie Valencia and I am a secondary instructional science coach. So I work with all of the teachers for, um, of seventh grade, eighth grade science, as well as high school science. And then um, we all are gonna benefit from Miss Peggy Hernandez. And I am the planetarium teacher. This is my 11th year teaching in the planetarium. And before that I did 15 years of middle school science teaching and before that, I was a kindergarten and a first grade teacher for a few years, and I love history, and I love the stars, and I love teaching, so this is like um, a perfect storm, you could say, uh, for, um, for what I do here, and I love talking about things that are coming up, which is the theme for today, two eclipses on the horizon, on the horizon, and that's not a typo, there are two eclips eclipses coming up in the next few months, and they're both gonna be visible only on the horizon. So I'm gonna to get to those in just a moment. I have a slightly different order of operations that I want to do here. And it's going to involve stopping this presentation for a moment so that we can look at this. I love looking at our solar system. I love looking, I like this site, nine planets, so I can go to the top, I can go to the side, and I want to talk about the planets that are going to be visible this summer. Planets are always fun to look for. They're usually really bright, like way more noticeable than stars. And uh, when you see a really bright star in the sky, when I was a kid, I was taught that you say that little poem, starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight. I, I wish I, I make a wish tonight and I would never get my wish. And that's because I was probably making a wish on a planet because the planets are the first thing that show up because they're brighter than stars usually. Um, so let's start from the inside out. Where is Mercury tonight? I have this set up right now for our actual May 18th, 2021 tonight. This is the lineup. If you're on planet Earth, if you're on the side facing the sun, well, it's daytime. So you won't be able to see the planets at all. And what we see out at night would be the things out in this direction, which 
There's really not a lot in the mid evening. But the thing is, as the earth spins, and I can let you watch the earth rotate, this side is the darkness leading to the light. So that's morning. And then over here on this side, that's the light leading into the dark side, nighttime. So everything over here on this side of the sky is visible in the evening. So we really do have Mercury, Venus, and Mars tonight. The problem is Mercury and Venus are really close to the sun because Mercury and Venus are really close to the sun. They're always close to the sun. But there's certain days where Venus and Mercury both are more visible than others. And it's when they're off to the side from the sun as much as they can possibly be. Um, Mercury has been visible this week. Actually, one of the best viewings of Mercury all year. It's far enough away from the sun that as the sun sets, you can see Mercury right above it. Now watch what happens as time goes on. So we're, we're in a good time. We're on May 22nd right now. We're in a, a few days ahead. We're in a good time to be watching Mercury. But as we progress... By the time we get to June, you can't see Mercury at all anymore because it's right in front of the sun. So we're going to go several weeks without seeing it. It comes up again in the evening. Um, I'm sorry, in the morning, later in the summer, but it stays so close to the sun in that movement that it's really not worth looking for. We will be able to see it um, in October, November in the early morning sky. That'll be the next time we'll be able to see Mercury. Venus, on the other hand, if I go back to today, Venus is even closer to the sun. Venus is like, you can't see it tonight, but we're heading into an excellent time to watch Venus. And if you watch this position, if I, if I keep us lined up with the earth, notice that Venus is kind of pulling away from the sun from our point of view. That makes for excellent Venus viewing. So Venus is going to be up in the evening sky. It's going to be getting brighter. For the next few months here we are at the end of june it's pretty far away from the sun you'll see it all evening uh, in the evening sky probably about until bedtime or so and venus and mercury then are both pretty good for this summer mercury only early really late spring um, and then venus is much more visible so venus will be real bright this summer that'll be an awesome one to look for so then let's look at mars this is where Mars is tonight. Mercury and Venus real close to the sun. Mars is way over here. As soon as you, it gets dark out, we can already see it. Imagine yourself being on the Earth. Once the sun comes up and you make it halfway around to say noon, that's about the time that Mars becomes visible. So when it gets dark out, Mars is already up in the southwestern sky. But if you give it a little bit of time, say midnight or so. So if you're all the way over here on the, on the Earth, say right here, you won't be able to see Mars after midnight. So what happens is Mars sets after midnight. Now the bad news is about Mars, if you watch the movement here, you'll see that the Earth is faster than Mars in its orbit. And notice how we're pulling away from Mars well, because we're faster. Yeah, so we're going to be perfectly opposite the sun from Mars in August. And that makes for terrible viewing. In other words, Mars will be up during the day. We're going to have to wait like nine months to be able to see Mars again. So we're seeing the last of Mars. And every day that we watch it from now until when it disappears in August, every day it's a little bit dimmer because every day we're getting a little bit farther from it. On the other hand, if I go out just a little bit, the other two visible planets we have are Jupiter and Saturn. I'm going to spin our solar system around so they're out in that direction. And then if I zoom back in so we can see where Earth is. So we're right here. Let me put it this way. So these are the evening planets. So anything on this side of the Earth would be visible early morning. And lo and behold, that happens to be Jupiter and Saturn. Right now they're coming up at about 2 in the morning. Yeah, Jupiter comes up at about 2 a.m. By June, it comes up at midnight. In July, it rises at about 1015. I'm kind of a night owl in the summer, especially. So 1015 is doable. And by August, it rises at eight o'clock. And that's because it goes uh, into opposition. So it'll be rising the moment that the sun sets for us. And I can fast forward this a little bit to show you what I mean. 
So Jupiter and Saturn are out that way. Oh, they're way slower in their orbit than the Earth is. But if I fast forward a little bit, give it some time, we will be pretty much in between the sun and those two planets in August. I don't remember the exact dates of the two. It's, it's, they're about a week or two apart. But what that means is they're going to look great. The sun is shining on Jupiter. The sun is shining on the whole of Saturn, the whole of Jupiter. And they'll be visible pretty much all night long later in the summer. So Jupiter and Saturn will be just rising. So they'll be in the east, southeast, just coming up. And our Venus uh, and Mercury in May. They're going to be in the evening sky setting, so that's always in the west. And Mars will also be in the west. So those are the planets that we're going to be able to see. This is a view from out in space. It's a way of thinking with your brain, this three-dimensional model that we have of our solar system. That's where the planets are. That's why we see them as they are. And I'm going to switch over and talk about the two eclipses that are coming up. And then we're going to spend the rest of the time looking at these in the night sky. And I can fast forward to different dates and, and look at um, pretty much any date. So I'm going to pause here and let me know if there's anything you want to re-see, you want me to show you again, or if you have any questions about this part, let me know. There is one question, but I'm not sure that it fits here. So you can tell me if you want to um, answer this one a little bit later. It's about um, what will happen when the sun becomes a red giant. Yeah, um, yeah, that doesn't have anything to do with the planet positions, but yeah, well, when the sun becomes a red giant, I, well, honestly, I'm not really worried about it. And it, th I don't know if that question means what will happen to me, like personally, what will happen to you, what will happen to my house, what will happen to life, what will happen to, I mean, that's kind of a broad question, but I need a little uh, refinement. So, so if you know what a red giant is, so you know the sun's going to turn into a red giant. So I'm assuming you know that that means it's going to swell up about to the orbit of Jupiter. So the sun will get about this big. So that puts all of the inner planets inside the sun, which is pretty, pretty hot inside the sun. And luckily, it's not expected to happen for roughly 5 billion years. So we don't need to worry about it for our kids or our grandkids, or, or it, it's not going to happen for 5 billion years. But when it happens, it will envelope the inner planets and they'll be, it'll be too hot um, for life as we know it on the planets. But who knows? Maybe by then we'll be traveling to the moons of Neptune. There's water. On, on a lot of the moons of other planets. So maybe we could start living on those other planets. Maybe we'll be zipping around and doing some kind of time travel. Who knows? We, we, we don't know for sure. Good question. Yeah, but it wasn't about the planets. That's okay. All right. So let's do this little thing on, on these eclipses. And I just have to mention this because there's going to be two eclipses coming up this summer. Well, May 26th, close to summer. May 26th and June 10th. On May 26th, we have a lunar eclipse. And here's the thing. It's happening during a supermoon. And it's a partial eclipse. So you're going to hear things on the internet. And, and friends are going to share it on Snapchat and Instagram. And you're going to see tweets about oh, the bloody, bloody super moon. There's a bloody super flower moon. I heard it was called a flower moon. Those things are made up by people. Flower, get it. It's May, lots of flowers. So they call it a flower moon. But it's not a bloody moon at all. That is not an astronomy term. No astronomer have, has ever associated it with like blood, guts, and violence. Um, it's made up by people who share things on Twitter and Facebook to get a reaction out of people. Um, and, and there are stories about the blood moon when the, when the moon turns red, but it's not an astronomy thing. Those are stories. It has, there's, there's no like connection to, to blood other than it looks kind of orangish brown, which some people think that is the color of blood. Um, and that's the color that the moon does turn during lunar eclipses. So let's do that one first. On May 26th, we're going to have a lunar, a partial lunar eclipse here where we live in Chicago. A partial lunar. Now, lunar means you look at the moon, totally safe to look at. This is reflected sunlight. It's like the sun shining a flashlight on the moon, bouncing to your eyes. 
it is always safe to look at the moon during a full lunar eclipse when the moon goes all the way in the shadow of the earth it always looks this rusty orangish brown that's where the term bloody moon comes from i know i don't get it either it doesn't even look like blood but it does they always look sort of reddish brown like that now if you lived in hawaii or australia or anywhere in the pacific ocean you would be seeing a full total eclipse it's actually an annular eclipse but we are i'm sorry that's the solar one coming up but we are on the edge of being able to see it at all so what we're going to see during this super moon which by the way this this half moon on the right this is how big like through a telescope this is the moon on a super moon night the night when the moon is the biggest it can look a super moon is called a super moon because the moon looks a teeny tiny bit bigger than it usually does because the moon does not go around the earth in a perfect circle. It's slightly squished. It's an ellipse is the name of the shape. So there is a moment in its orbit every month when the moon is a little bit closer to or at its closest point to us. And about two weeks later, it's at its farthest point from us. No, about a week later, sorry. A week later, it's at its farthest point. So there's a day when it's closer and a day when it's farther. But you guys, it's not that much. You've gone your whole life without ever noticing a full moon up high in the sky that looked extra humongous because it doesn't. This, the one on the left, that's your average full moon. Same telescope, same, same magnification. So yeah, it is a little bit bigger. Would I call that like super bigger? I don't know. I would call it a little bit bigger moon, not the super moon, but I didn't make up the term. So we are in a super moon position. And some people consider it only the day when it's the closest. That's the super moon. Oh, other websites like to stretch it out and say the two days before and the two days after and the day of. Those are all super moon days because it gets a reaction out of people. Um, but I like to think of it as the day. That's the only day that there could be a super moon. And this is the, a close one. So we are going to have a super moon on that day. And it is perfectly lined up with the sun in that. Um, in, the earth is going to be in between the moon and the sun and the moon is going to go right through the shadow of the earth and we live on the earth so all of us that live on this dark side so it, it's only good for the people that live on this half they can look up in the sky and watch the moon go through the shadow that's a total lunar eclipse now some people are going to live off to the side and they're not going to see total they're not going to be able to see the total eclipse they'll see the moon partially covered by the shadow of the earth. That's what we're having, a partial eclipse. This whole area here, from here to here, and then again from here to here, um, that's called the penumbral shadow. A penumbra is um, like the edge of the shadow. And the penumbra, eh, it's not so noticeable when the moon goes, moon goes in there, but we will look. it will look like a chunk is taken out of the moon. Since we will not see it in the umbra completely, we will probably not get any of that orange, deep, bloody look about it. Um, this is a picture of a lunar eclipse. And the artist that took the picture added the exact correct size and shape of the sun of the Earth's shadow out in space. So if you squint your eye a little bit, you can see that it looks like a chunk is taken out of the top of the moon. This is pretty much what it's going to look like for us, although it's reversed. I think that the chunk is going to be off the bottom on May 26th. Um, and we, we do not normally get eclipses because the moon is not on the same orbital plane as the earth and the sun. And I know that's a mouthful, but you think of it like this. If the earth is here in space and it's this big and this direction is the sun, exactly even with this line. Oh, geez, that would be like, that would be like downtown Chicago. That's how far the sun would be away at the scale. But if you draw a perfectly straight line, this is called the plane of the ecliptic. This is the earth and the sun lined up together. Well, the moon goes around the earth tilted, according to that line, about five degrees. You know, it's not much. It's just five degrees, but the moon is 240,000 miles away. Most of the time, the moon is above or below the shadow when we have a new moon. So we do not get eclipses every month, but every once in a while, they do crisscross. There's a point where they touch the node and you can get an eclipse then. And then um, 
two weeks later, they're still going to be pretty close and you could get another eclipse two weeks later. It's called the eclipse season and they happen in pairs like that. So this is the lineup. The sun is shining on the earth. Here's the daytime side. Here's the nighttime side. The sun is shining, hitting the earth, giving us day. So everybody on this side can see it. The people on this side, they're out of luck. They can't see when it happens. It only takes about an hour for it to go through the umbra. So if you're over here ha having a happy, happy day out in the sunshine, you will not see the eclipse that night. Only the people on this side will see it. And the people on this side look out and they say, wow, that looks so orange. Why is it so orange? Why does it look bloody red? Well, it has to do with the fact that when the sunlight up here near the top and the bottom, actually all along this terminator line, the, the light is going through thousands of miles of atmosphere. Oh, like this one that's right on, uh, maybe a hundred miles of atmosphere. But when you're talking here, you're going through thousands of miles of atmosphere that has water vapor and it has other, other um, particles suspended in it. Well, one of them, especially the water vapor one, water bends light. You've probably seen that before when you have a straw in a glass of water and it looks like it's bent and it's really not bent, but the light waves get bent going through the water. Well, the same thing happens. Light waves get bent and they get hit bent just enough that they actually hit the moon. And the color that makes it to the moon is the long red waves, the waves that make the color red. So if you were on the moon, Imagine you were on the moon and you were looking at the nighttime side of Earth. It might look like this. Seriously, look, there's the Earth. There's India with all of its light pollution, all these other countries. Where, wherever there's a lot of lights, there's a lot of people. And we're looking at the other side of our Earth, but you can see that orange haze. That's the sunlight in the atmosphere. Oh, yeah. The sunlight's going through the atmosphere. It's bending as it goes through and notice the red ones, they're on the inside. They're the ones that actually make it to the surface of the moon. That's why it looks kind of reddish. So here's a sequence of pictures when there was an eclipse, when the moon was rising. So the moon was coming up full and then it looked like a chunk was taken out and then it went into full eclipse. The opposite's happening for us. The moon is already gonna be up. It's gonna be on its way down in the West when it starts happening. And we are not going to get to this point at all. We probably won't even get to the orange of this one. It's going to end up looking pretty much like this. And I suppose that part of the moon might start having a little rusty brownish look. But then the moon's going to set and the sun's going to come up. We only have it for about a half an hour or so. So here's the deal. It really is on the horizon. On Wednesday, the 26th, you're going to have to remember on Tuesday, the 25th because you got to set your alarm, because you have to be up at 445 outside, looking low in the west, and make sure there's no trees or houses or on anything on the horizon, otherwise you won't see it at all. At 445, the moon will start getting, it'll look like a bite's taken out of it. You could just look out a window if you want. Look for the moon at 445, and look low in the west, and every moment that you watch, that bite will get bigger as it's setting, and then it's going to disappear. The sun will actually kind of come up while it's happening, but that's okay. You can actually see the sun, the moon during the day. It won't be overpowering it. Um, but sunrise is at 523, but the moon sets at 520. So the sky will be getting bright, but you really have to be an early bird to enjoy that lunar eclipse on Wednesday, the 26th. And if it's raining or cloudy, remember you're out of luck. You won't be able to see it at all. So that's the lunar eclipse that's coming up. And I see there's a question. Is it a lunar eclipse question? I can do that now. It is a supermoon question. What okay. is supermoon? Uh, supermoon is when the moon is closest to the earth in its orbit because it does not go around us in a perfect circle. So the supermoon is the day that the moon is closest to us. There's one day every month where it's closest to us. And then the super mini moon is the one day when it's farthest from us. So there's always a day when it's closest and always a day when it's farthest. And that's the super moon and the super mini moon. 
And for some reason, the internet doesn't go so crazy over the super mini moon. Like, ooh, look at the moon, it's so little tonight. Yeah, that's because it's not noticeable. Neither is a super moon. It's not noticeable. There's a weird phenomenon with the moon when it's just rising that always makes it look a little bit bigger to some people. It's not even to everyone. And scientists have studied it. They took out little tools and they measured it. And it was exactly the same size on the horizon as it was up in the sky. That's why I say it's an illusion. Like it looks bigger, but it's actually not. And nobody knows for sure exactly why. But a supermoon is actually a little bit bigger than your average sized full moon. Is there one more? I think I see one in the chat. Okay, it's not a question in the chat. Okay, so let's go to the other one, June 10th. June 10th, two weeks later, the moon that was over here for the eclipse, lunar eclipse, two weeks later, now it's over here. Now it's on the other side. And what's going to happen is we're going to have a total solar eclipse. Yeah, it'll be a total solar eclipse, except for us. We won't see it total. It's pretty rare to see a total eclipse because the shadow of the moon is cone shaped. So only the people right there in that black circle actually get to see the total, the sun totally and completely covered. And that's not this one. This is just an example one. Only the people right there. I mean, you cannot fit all the people on the earth in that one spot. But everybody in this shaded area can see a partial, which means the moon partially covers the sun. And that's what we're going to get. It, don't, it only happens during a new moon, just like um, a lunar eclipse only happens during a full moon when they're opposite each other. Um, we're going to have a new moon on June 10th, and the moon is actually going to go in front of the sun. Now, normally, the moon goes just underneath it or just above it. Again, that's because the planes are a little bit off from each other, but every once in a while, the moon goes right in front of the sun, and it makes it dark outside, and a full total eclipse is amazing. Um, but we're going to have a partial and we're only going to see the last few minutes of it as the sun is rising. Okay, wrap your head around that. We're only going to see the last few minutes of this solar eclipse as the sun is rising. So again, if you lived in Hawaii, you'd be seeing this, but we won't be seeing it here. This is about what we'll see. As the sun is rising, like the eclipse is already happening, but as soon as the sun comes above the horizon, it's going to be about 30% covered, about, about this much. You, you have to have a clear view of the east, northeast. I, honestly, you, you could go upstairs if you have an upstairs, and if you got a good view of the east, northeast, that might be the best spot to see it because it'll be so low. And if you have solar filters and you look at it, this is what it'll look like. The sun will look like a bite's taken out of it. That's not a bite. That's the moon. That's the moon that's actually right in front of the sun. That's a partial solar eclipse. This portion of the sun is totally blaring its ultraviolet light out and all the other light that it sends out. Ultraviolet gives you sunburn, infrared makes you feel warm. And then there's gamma rays and X-rays and, and everything else. It's giving off all of its energy that it always does. So you won't be able to stare at it. You'll be like, oh man, I don't know. I can't see anything. It hurts my eyes. It looks like a normal sun. Yeah, it's still giving off most of its light. You won't be able to stare at it. Um, but you, you will be able to look at it if you happen to have a solar filter. Or you can somehow uh, reflect the image of the sun with a mirror onto a wall or project it through a little, poke a little hole in a cereal box. And you can project that on the bottom of the cereal box and then look in and see that. There's all sorts of projection, um, homemade projection devices you can look up on the internet. Um, but what I'm going to recommend before June 10th is get your solar glasses. Seriously, remember from the August one a couple of years ago, I told everyone and told everyone for like two years in advance and the week before everybody on earth tried to go on Amazon and buy solar filters. By that time, most of them are not legit. They're not truly safe and we couldn't, we can't even use them. It's not safe. But if you buy a pair of solar glasses now off the internet, they're cheap 
And if you take care of them, tuck them away in a cabinet, don't play with them, they're going to be good for the next one. Yeah, we have another solar eclipse, a good one coming here in 2024. And you can use the glasses then. Um, they do have legit ones on Amazon. And three very popular companies here in the US, Rainbow Symphony Optics, Thousand Oaks Optics, American Paper and Optics. Those are all good places to buy these um, solar glasses, all sorts of different kinds. It doesn't even have to be glasses. You can buy little square ones like an index card and you can use that to look at the sun. There's an entire web page that the American Astronomical Society puts out to gives you, it gives you a list of, of list, uh, legitimate places to buy your solar glasses. So if you go on Amazon and it's the name of some company you've never heard of and they're not on that list, I would recommend you don't buy them. Otherwise, these are guaranteed to be safe for staring at the sun. So April, April 8th, 2024 is that full one, but June 10th is the one coming up next this summer. Yes. Oh, sorry. There's a great question about how would you know if they were fake or not? Well, I would, it, I mean, there's no way for you to test it. So the best way is for you to buy it from a legitimate company. And for example, here, I, I, the American Astronomical Society. And I think I left up, here it is. Here's their page, American Astronomical Society. And here they tell you about the genuine filters and how you know if they're reputable or not. And then you scroll down and it, what about eclipse glasses and handheld viewers? Well, they have to be ISO 12312-2 international safety standards. They have to block like 99.00007 of all light. I don't remember the exact number, but all of these solar viewers are guaranteed to be legitimate. Here's Rainbow Symphony. Here's American Paper Optics. Here's another one, Celestron. They make telescopes, a telescope maker a company that makes telescopes, they'd probably be pretty legit. Um, uh, flipping shades, normally I would be a little, mm, I don't know about flipping shades, but they have it listed here. So it's probably okay. I would, I would order from them because they check to make sure that these are good. And once you buy them, you just have to make sure. Don't ever crumple them. Uh, don't ever shove them in your pocket. Keep them smooth, keep them flat, put them in an envelope, tuck them away in a closet where nobody touches things and then pull that envelope out again in a couple of years, and you've got your eclipse glasses that everybody's gonna be going crazy looking for. Oh, I need my glasses. I can't find glasses anywhere. And you could be the one that's ready. You could even buy extra ones and give them out to your friends. They're not expensive. The more you buy, of course, the cheaper they are. Um, but this is where you can order them easily online. That's what I recommend. Most stores don't like have them. I mean, they'll have them the week before, the eclipse, but you can't like go into Dick's Sporting Goods or Walmart and ask for solar glasses because they don't carry them. You pretty much have to order them online nowadays. Yeah, good question. So are there any solar eclipse questions about this one coming up? Yeah, and if, you, um, if you're with us, go ahead and uh, put them in the chat, the Q&A, and then if you're watching, um, on Facebook, you can you can put questions there and I can get them in. So let's go and look at these in the night sky. Well, actually, we're in the day sky right now. I have this set up for today, 518, May 18th at 630 at night. That's the time right now, 631, 51. And I'm going to um, aim us a little bit more towards the west. Mm -hmm. There we are. So if we're aimed towards the west at this time, that's where the sun is on the horizon. Now it's kind of drizzling here where I am. There's a lot of clouds, but the sun is definitely behind those clouds. The sun is gonna set tonight and it is gonna get dark out tonight. Here's what it'll look like if we let the sun set tonight and there were no clouds. Nice clear view of my west, northwest horizon. That's where the sun's gonna set. And if I let it go down right there, just as the sun is setting at 518, the moon is gonna be visible tonight. We've got a half moon. It's up right now. You can't see it because there's clouds. If it was a clear night, we would be able to see it for sure. But let's just let the nighttime happen. 
So the sun sets at about 8.03 tonight. I think that's right. I mean, it's after eight o'clock. I just think back to January when it was dark by 4.30 and we're four hours later now and it's still light out. That's what happens. I'm going to fast forward time just a little bit. Now, this totally makes sense that if the sun is out here 93 million miles straight in that direction and it's shining its light up, wow, it totally makes sense that that's the side of the moon that's lit up. That's why we have a waxing crescent moon tonight. We're heading to a first quarter moon. We're very close to it right now, um, but it's a really waxing crescent, meaning it's getting bigger. And as the sun goes down, just like every other night, the stars are going to come out. The brighter things show up first. The sun didn't even set yet. It's still barely touching the horizon right there. Now the sky is changing. It's definitely looking different. Beautiful sunset tonight. 810. Now it's 815. Hey, there's something visible and it's not even dark out yet. Remember, Venus was far enough away from the sun tonight that we could see it. Now I'm going to pause right here for a second because I just saw something come up from the Southwest. And it, I can tell that it's incredibly bright. It's about as bright as Venus. And Venus is so bright, you can see it in the sunset, in the haze of sunset. Mercury, on the other hand, it's just barely a tiny little dot. And, and if wherever you are right now, if you could turn off your lights, like if you're in a room and it won't disturb anyone to turn off all the lights, it actually would be even easier to see this if you're having trouble seeing mercury because it's visible it's right there just barely and the brighter a circle is on this software the bright the bigger the circle is the brighter it is this object here is as bright as venus and if i let time go on just regular time and you stare at that thing it's moving that object is moving across the sky now i know the first reaction for some human beings to right away is completely to jump into fiction and say it must be a UFO. It's not a UFO. Other people would jump forward and say, oh, yeah, I just sped up time a little bit. They'd say, oh, yeah, that's, um, that's a shooting star. No way. Shooting stars are there and gone in less than a second. That can't be a shooting star. And it, it can't. It's actually the International Space Station. Crew Dragon is on there. The International Space Station really does cross the sky tonight, starting at about 828, rises in the southwest, and it's going to go across the sky. Oh, and you can look those up anytime. There's a website called Heavens Above. Heavens Above. And they list all sorts of things that are, that are going to track across the sky. And you can click on International Space Station, and it'll list the direction, what time, how high it's going to get. Ooh, it's going to go right next to the moon at 8 30 tonight golly i wish the sky was clear because that could be your homework you could go out at 8 30 and watch the international space station go right past the moon nothing happens it's not really next to the moon the international space station is a couple hundred miles up the moon is 240,000 miles away this thing's way closer and it will continue to go across the sky and then it will eventually either disappear below the horizon or it just flashes out because it ends up in the shadow of the earth and the sunlight doesn't hit it anymore and you can't see it anymore. So around 8.30 tonight, we do have an International Space Station crossing. For those of us in the Chicago area, if you're watching from somewhere else, go to Heavens Above and check for your times. But it's 8.30 right now and I'm starting to see more stars. There's a bright one there. Oh, I got a, caught a satellite right there that I can't even see. That star is Capella. That's a bright one. This is Procyon. These two stars are on either side of a constellation called Gemini the Twins. As it gets darker here, I want to see if you can notice that. These two matching stars right here, Gemini the Twins. If I draw in the lines, I can let you see it. It's two brothers holding hands. Oh, yeah. And remember when I showed you the nine planets? Venus, Mercury, and Mars 
are all visible right after sunset today. Mars is right between the two brothers, like, uh, like one of them's holding a basketball. They're just coming back from shooting hoops. There's Mercury and there's Venus. Mercury has been visible this week. Now, I had to go upstairs to the second story of my house to look out because we have trees and houses in the West Northwest. But once I got up high enough, I was able to see uh, Mercury. It just looks like a dim star in the sky. That's what planets look like. They look like stars in the sky. Mercury always looks dim because it's so small. Venus, that is not dim. But the problem is by the time um, uh, v Venus is visible, there goes another satellite, if I can catch it. it that one's ERS-2 from NORAD. They're all named and numbered and tracked. Um, look at how low Venus is on the horizon. I mean, it's practically touching it. If you go outside when it's finally dark out, you already missed Venus. Uh, but Mercury will be visible for a little while. I'm going to fast forward a little bit to complete darkness, to like full nighttime, which we're at nine o'clock right now. Nine o'clock when it's finally, finally dark. So in the West, we have Gemini, the twins. Right there, Gemini, the twins will be up for sure. Mars is in between the two of them. That bright star Capella is in the constellation Origa. Uh, it looks like a house. I mean, this is actually a goat. It's a dude driving a chariot, holding onto a goat. And that bright star there is the goat. But I always think it looks like a pentagon. And then Procyon right here. Oh yeah, these two stars, that's the little dog. Doesn't it look just like a dog? Not. I didn't make these up. I'm just the messenger. The ancient Greek people said, hey, that must be the little dog. And everybody caught on and said, yeah, it looks like a little dog. And we still call it the little dog. Uh, it doesn't really look like a dog. Some of these things in the sky that the Greeks made up really does look like what it's supposed to. And in my opinion, some of them don't. And that's okay. It's just, that's just how it is. So. There's a question related to the dog. Yeah. The question is asking, is it Arcturus? Is what? Is the dog Arcturus? No, the dog star is Procyon. Procyon is the dog star, the little dog. Sirius is part of the big dog. And it's about down here. It's below the horizon. But Arcturus is up in the spring and the summer. It's just not in the West. We're going to get to that one in just a second. Um, time is still going on. Let's spin our bodies a little bit to the South. So aim yourself to the South. So here we go. I'm going to turn you so that you're facing more South. So now the sun is off, um, off your right shoulder. Now you're looking at the Southern sky. Let's Let's point out just the brightest stars. So that's still Procyon. Now it's off to the right now. And we also have this one here. That's Spica. It's in Virgo. And this bright star right here, Arcturus. It's a red giant star. It's super bright and noticeable. It's part of Boutes. It's supposed to be a shepherd. Um, but I think it looks like an ice cream cone kind of on its side. And part of it's cut off here. I, I could back us up a little bit and you'd be able to see the whole thing better. There we go. Let's put the lines on. Does anybody recognize Leo the lion? Leo the lion is always up in the south in the spring and early summer. It's actually about to take a bite out of the moon. Leo the lion is that backwards question mark. Regulus is the bright star on the bottom of it. And the moon is right in front of it tonight. And right here is Arcturus. And there's that, I think it looks like an ice cream cone. And there's a cool way to know if something is Arcturus or not. There's a trick. And I have to go to the, to the Northeast to show it to you. So let's spin our bodies some more towards the East. So you're gonna spin to the left. Let's kind of look Northeast here. So these are all the stars that are now in the Northeast. Now I can still see Spica. I can still see Arcturus. They're both still visible, but the Big Dipper is visible now too. Do you see the Big Dipper? I'll give you a moment. Yep, that's it right there. That's the Big Dipper. Now the handle of the Big Dipper curves like a slide. Another name for a curve is an arc, A-R-C, arc. And you can arc to Arcturus. Look, the handle practically points to it. So if you're outside and you see an orangish colored star and you're not sure, like, is that Mars? Is that Arcturus? What is that? 
look around for the little, the big dipper. If you see the big dipper and its handle points right to it, you found Arcturus and you can also spike onto Spica. Now at home, it's gonna look more like this, but you can follow the handle and arc to Arcturus and spike onto Spica. Spica is in the constellation Virgo, the beautiful maiden. There she is right there. And right next to um, Arcturus's uh, kite or ice cream cone is one called the Corona Borealis. It's the crown of the north. It's an almost perfect half circle. That's why ancient people said, wow, that looks just like a crown we'd put on the king or the queen. So it's called the crown of the north and Corona means crown and Borealis means north. So that's what that one is. And, you know, we did find the Big Dipper. If I turn all of this off again, when you find the Big Dipper, please do not start screaming Little Dipper. I mean, when somebody does that, I always know they don't know what they're talking about. Because if you see a Dipper, the first thing you see is a Dipper, there is about a 100% chance it's the Big Dipper. I mean, that's the one your eyes can see. So that's the one your eyes notice first. It's always the Big Dipper. But once you find the Big Dipper, and here it is, here's the handle, and here's the saucepan. Always use the last two stars in the saucepan as your pointers to follow, 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 follow to the North Star. And that is connected to Little Dipper. The North Star is the 49th brightest star in the sky. 48 stars are brighter than this star right here. In no way, shape or form, would any person ever go outside and pick the 49th brightest star and say, wow, look how bright that star is. They'd be completely wrong. That is not a bright star. It's never been bright. But the North Star is the star that's directly above the North Pole of the Earth. That's what makes it special. And it's part of the Little Dipper. Here's all the drawings if you like to see those. The Dipper is actually inside of the Little Bear and the Big Bear. Tonight, the big bear is completely upside down, and the handle is actually her crazy long tail. What are some other ones up in the east early in our evening? Because we're only at nine o'clock here. We've got um, Hercules right next to the Corona Borealis. Uh, oh, we have the swan coming up. Oh, Vega. This is the brightest star in our sky. It's part of like a little musical instrument, like a harp. And Cassiopeia the Queen is low in the north. And if we go later in the evening, I'm going to fast forward. I'm going to go later in the evening. And I'm going to move us a little bit more towards the south. And what I mean is, I don't know, let's go to like midnight or one in the morning. So two, oh, 3.47 in the morning. We're early, early morning now. We stayed up really late. Actually, I want to go back a little bit. Because if I go to about one in the morning, this is the sky we see in the summertime. This is our summertime sky in the south. The bright stars are Spica is still up. That's in Virgo. So up here is probably Arcturus. And here we have Vega. And here we have Deneb, the tail of the swan. That's part of the Northern Cross. Right here is the cross. Altair and Aguila the eagle is really bright. Here's the lines. I'll draw them in. You can kind of tell that looks like a cross right there. Hercules is up higher. Corona Borealis is up higher. That's because everything moved up in the sky because we're now at about midnight. And this time of year, um, around 1146, this is what it looks like. But this is what the sky looks like in, in June, in the early evening. Oh, did anybody else notice another satellite's going by at 1147 tonight? Could even be the International Space Station again. It only takes it 90 minutes to go all the way around the Earth. Let's see. Yep. Crew Dragon, that's the, that's the International Space Station. That's it, that's a good, that's another bright one. Two good showings of the International Space Station tonight. And let's go back to the north. I want you to spot the big and little dipper. And then I'm gonna show you what's special about the little dipper, why everyone goes crazy. I'm gonna let time go on. We're gonna fast forward a little bit. And look at that star and notice that all the stars in the sky are spinning around that point. That's because our earth spins on that north south axis. 
So everything spins around this star. That's what makes it special. Not because it's super bright, because it stays in the same spot all night long. That star never moves. That's another satellite going by. Perfectly normal. They slow down around this time when we're in the deepest part of the shadow of the Earth out in space. And then early in the morning, like after midnight, that's when we're going to start seeing Jupiter and Saturn. So I'm going to head back towards the south. We're going to wait for them to come up. That is Arcturus. I'm sorry. And Tares, another red giant star. That's the heart of the scorpion. So tonight that doesn't come up until one o'clock in the morning. But in the summertime, scorpion, the scorpion is up all evening long. So here we are, 1.30, almost two o'clock in the morning. And that's when Jupiter and Saturn are going to come up. Oh, there's Saturn. That's the first one. So we've got Saturn coming up right now. And then about half an hour later, Jupiter comes up uh, and they're both moving in their orbit. Saturn's a little bit slower, uh, but Jupiter went past Saturn in December. So they're not getting closer. Jupiter's actually getting farther and farther from Saturn in our view this uh, next couple of months. But every night they're rising a little earlier to the point when we get to August, they're going to be coming up at eight o'clock at night. Super easy to notice. And then we're back at sunrise. If you look towards the east, the sky is getting brighter. And there we are. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do a couple of questions now. And then we're going to, we'll fast forward to those two eclipse dates and try to take a look at it as it happens. So I'm going to pause here and let's do those questions. We've had a couple of um, really interesting questions. One is, um, where is Ursa Minor? So you may not be showing that right now. And then the second question is about um, the relationship or the importance of Arcturus to um, the Chicago World's Fair of 1933. Yeah, it does, it does have a pretty neat connection. So let me go back to the Northern Sky to answer the first one. So if I put on the lines, and the drawings, Ursa Minor is bear small. Ursa means bear, minor means small. So Ursa Minor is the Little Dipper. Ursa Major is bear big. We call it the big bear. Um, and that's where uh, the Little Dipper resides, kind of inside that constellation. It's not a constellation itself, but yeah. And then if you follow the tail, there is Arcturus in the constellation Bootes, and it is about 40 light years away. And during the Chicago World's Fair, that was exactly 40 years after the Columbian Ex Exposition in, in 1892, the World's Fair in Chicago in 32, there was new technology that was developed out of University of Illinois and Harvard and a couple of other universities to make this nifty little thing um, called a photo cell. That's what they named it because it could take light. You could shine light on it and change it into electricity. So what they did was they said, let's honor the last World's Fair and aim a telescope at that star and then let the light hit the photo cell to turn on the lights at the fair. And they thought it was a great idea. And that's exactly what they did. And the fact is, since it's 40 light years away, what that means is it is so far away that when it gives off a photon of light, it takes 40 years to get to our eyes. So the light coming from Arcturus that night when it turned on the lights at the fair was the light that was being given off at the last World's Fair. They ended up doing it every night. It was a great little gimmicky thing. And they whew, would turn on all the lights and say, oh, this technology is so great. And Photo cells are commonly, commonly used today. Um, we can, we know for sure that we can change light into electricity um, using technology like that. So yeah, good questions. Anything else? Oh, it looks like we have some in the chat. Uh, they're, the, they're the same question, but um, somebody did ask about Stellarium. So I was able to give that website oh. out anything about that yes thank you for putting that in there this what i'm using is free open source software it's called stellarium stellarium.org was developed by planetarians and i am using the downloaded version 
There is though, if you go to the website, there's only one stellarium.org, um, there's a web version. Um, and it might not have every single feature that I have at my fingertips here, but that's okay. I know it has the basics and you can just run it straight off of the internet if you have it. And it's kind of fun. Just make sure you set up our location. We're at like 42 degrees North latitude, about 88 um, West longitude. Make sure those are set up right. So you're at the right location. And the things that really happen tonight really show up in this software. That is amazing technology. And thank you for putting heavens above in there too. Again, put your location in, click the 10 day predictions and it'll list every bright thing that's gonna go past um, in, the, in the night sky. You could check it every night if you want. And then you set your cell phone about a minute before it happens to go off so you can run outside and watch it happen. And it works because I do it all the time. It's pretty fun. So that solar eclipse is going to happen on June 10th as the sun is rising. I'm going to get rid of all the names and the lines. So the sun didn't come up yet. It's 448 right now. So that solar eclipse, you're going to watch it from 540 in the morning. I'm sorry, from 517. And it'll be pretty much done by 540. So we're at 448. That would be a good time to go out. Uh, you'll be able to tell where the sun's going to come up because the whole horizon like looks kind of bright. Oh, and while you're out there, look off to the right. You should be able to see Jupiter and Saturn in the south. Oh, they came up hours ago at 449 in the morning. They've, they've definitely been up for a while. And that is the bright star Capella coming up right before the sun. That is really bright. So I'm going to fast forward time a little bit. We should have a sunrise around 517. I mean, I could be a minute or two off because of my location, but this will be close enough. So I'm watching the time scroll by right here on the bottom. So we're almost at five and I'll slow down at 515. So here we go. So we should be watching right here. The sun should be coming up. I'll zoom in a little bit. See what we can see. Here's 516, the sunrise should be at about 517. So we're getting close. I'm not gonna mess with it and go any faster. But on this day, as the sun rises, the moon should be partially blocking the sun. Oh, and I have the moon 10 times exaggerated in size. Otherwise it's really hard to detect the phase on software like this. So our moon is gonna come up looking huger than it really should. So there are some hills. This looks like maybe a small mountain range. This is like from Austria, this landscape. So the sun is up on the other side of those, those hills. Let's keep going. Oh, there it is. Seriously, this is how low you're gonna have to look on the horizon to be able to see it, minus the mountains that we don't have. Now, this image is making it look like it's a full, total solar eclipse. I have this moon enlarged 10 times bigger than it's supposed to be because otherwise it, um, it, you can't tell the phase. It ends up being too small. So if you imagine this being 10 times smaller, it just covers a little section of the sun. And if you have special solar glasses, you would be able to see that it looks like a bite is being taken out of the moon. So that's the solar eclipse on June 10th. And we could go to the 26th. Let's see. On the 26th, as the sun is rising, it's a full moon. So if the sun is rising in front of you, that means the moon is setting behind you. Because during a full moon, the moon is on one side of the earth and the sun is on the other. So if you're here looking at the sun, the moon's over here. So if you're looking at the moon, then the sun's over here. So let's turn around. Early morning on the 26th, instead of facing east, let's face west. I'm going to back up. Did we already miss it? What time did we have to go out? Ooh, we had to go out at 4.45. Already missed it. I'm going to go back in time. 
I'm going to go to 445, right before the sun comes up. We're, we were pretty close. We were about an hour off. In an hour, the moon will be gone. And as the sun is, as the moon is setting, so now behind your head, the sun's coming up. The sky is getting bright behind you because the sun is rising over there. And what you'll notice is it'll look like a bite is taken. And I see it. I can just barely see it. The software is really cool. See how there's a grayed out spot over there? It's on the bottom left. That grayed out spot is going to continue to get bigger until the moon goes down and disappears. And the people that are uh, below the horizon that far away from us will be able to watch it, just not us. So we will see this partial lunar eclipse if you happen to be up at five o'clock in the morning on May 26th. We could do that. Five in the morning, May 26th. Uh, it's a Wednesday. Look out. And I almost see a hint of orange there, I think. So by five, it's 510. The bottom part of the moon is starting to touch the horizon here. And then that'll be it. So the next good lunar eclipse is, I'm not sure. I actually didn't look that up. But the next solar eclipse is April 8th, 2024. And instead of going from Washington state out through the Carolinas, it's going to start crossing the United States, like Southern California, Mexico, go all the way across the United States through Southern Illinois again, and then out Nova Scotia. So there will be a solar eclipse over Nova Scotia and see about 30% of the moon is blocked here. And that's all that we're going to see from where we live. So yeah, what else would you like to see? What kind of questions do you have? What else can I show you? Still a pretty cool eclipse. Yeah, it is. It'll, it's cool. If you're up early, if you're an early bird, that's that's not ridiculously early, five o'clock. A lot of people get up that early to go to work. And yeah. you'll notice as it's getting lower, it's still getting bigger. The biggest bad thing would be is if it's cloudy. If it's cloudy, you won't be able to see it. Yeah. I set my alarm already. You're better than I am. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for us, either on Facebook or um, anything else you'd like? I can any, show you. Yep. Anything else I could show you? I could zip to. I can go back to today's current date and time. I could go to next mm -hmm. week. We could go to tomorrow. I back up and then we can go to the next day and 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 we can see that the moon moves to the left as it grows, moves away from the sun. And I don't see any coming in the chat and it looks like we're clear on the other Facebook and Q&A end. Yeah. So we're at our seven o'clock time. So timing is good. I think we're finished here. Thanks for coming, everyone. There'll be a recording of this um, on the science page, the yes, science we'll put it on our page. E46 science page. Yep. Yeah. So just email us if to... you. Yeah. Oh, uh, something came in. Oh, just a buy. Oh, uh, can you spell the name of the software? Sure. Um, yep. um, I will, um, Marge, I can put it here. in. Uh, or here, I'll, I'll finish with this. Let's go like this. Right. I'll just open up the tab. S T E, see, it's popping up already. L L. A R I U M dot org. And the page looks like this when it opens up. That's it. This is the correct page. That's what it looks like. This is the latest version. So these are downloads you can do, but you click on this one that says Stellarium Web and it goes to the web version that you can manipulate on your own. Stellarium is the name of it. I mean, Worldwide Telescope does similar things too. Um, and that's also a free download. It does a lot of the same stuff. So thanks for coming, everyone. Have a happy uh, summer viewing our beautiful night sky with family and friends this year, hopefully. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, uh, Peggy, for, for tonight. Thank you, Frankie. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close it out. Bye, everybody. Okay. Goodbye, you. everyone. <laughs>